On today's Film & Whiskey, we're joined by three of our Patreon patrons for a special roundtable discussion where they ask us questions ranging from movies to whiskey to everything in between. That's all ahead on Film & Whiskey. Hey, everybody. Welcome into the podcast. We are back with another special bonus episode. Bonus episode. Brad, this is one that I am really, really excited for. We're trying something we've never, ever done before. And we've brought in three of our Patreon patrons to do a roundtable discussion with us. Brad and I have almost no idea what is going to happen during this uh, this episode they've <laughs> they've each prepared some questions to ask us and i told them they could be as wide ranging as just you know opinions on movies or whiskeys or things that are purposely designed to make me and brad fight with each other so who knows where this is going to go but i am super pumped to get into this brad yeah i mean you know our audience probably knows that that bob you and i both went to uh get ministry type degrees and one of the earliest lessons i learned and bob you could probably say it for me is be careful who you hand the mic to, that you just, you never know what's going to happen to people when they get up front on the stage and you give them a microphone and an audience. You just don't know what's going to happen. Um, luckily for us, this isn't live. Uh, we have a editing room and we hopefully won't have to use any of it. Well, we will find out about that. But before we get around to talking about the editing, Brad, let's introduce our three patrons that we have with us today. First, we have our friend Austin from the Bourboneering Podcast, one of our oldest and best friends in the podcasting world. Austin, say hello to the people and, and maybe tell the story of how you found Film and Whiskey. Yeah. Oh, hey, guys. I'm Austin. I'm the host of the Bourboneering Podcast. And when I first got into whiskey, before I even had my own podcast, I was looking for other whiskey podcasts. So I just did a Google search. And film and whiskey popped up, and I'm a new, uh, newly found film buff and a whiskey addict. So I fell in love instantly. Man, uh, I believe that's actually pronounced alcoholic, <laughs> not addict. <laughs> All right. Well, now that Brad has insulted the first of our guests, let's let's see if we can go three for three here. Second, we have our friend Chris, who goes by the name Aperture Flash. We've mentioned him on the podcast before. Uh, I have to say, like, I did not know his first name until this evening. He is a man of mystery. Chris, Aperture Flash, can you say hello to the people and how you found film and whiskey? I found you guys uh, when you joined the Robots Radio Network. Uh, I was very heavily involved with them and... Um... You know, the, the show appealed to me because I like movies and I like whiskey. So it seemed like a good fit. Pretty much our core demographic right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bob came to me one day and he goes, you know, we like movies and whiskey. Let's talk about it. If you guys ever do an episode on big trucks, it'll, like I won't ever need another podcast ever, <laughs> ever again. There, there you go. <laughs> trucks in movies. Well, we're going from somebody that we had absolutely no prior connection to, to one of both Brad and my oldest and best friends in the world, our friend Corey Easterday, who is the host of the Easter Pod. Corey has been a supporter of ours for a long, long time. It's so good to have him here. Corey, you're up, buddy. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for having me on. Uh, I dare say, aside from your parents and your families, that I might be one of the original supporters of Bob and Brad and uh, Film and Whiskey before it was even a thing. Um, no, I kid, but we go back, uh, Bob and I to high school, Brad and I uh, to college, Bob, I mean, we all went to the same college, so it's just been, honestly, in, in a very genuine way, it's been cool to see the growth of both of you as people, to like be your friend, be in your lives, and to see the growth of this podcast. I can remember lots of conversations before this was even a thing, and to see where it's gone from like day one, that first episode, to where it's at now, it's been just a joy and a pleasure to, to be along for the ride. Yeah, it's so good to have you here, man. It's it's very comforting to have Corey here. It's also really risky and dangerous because I don't know what his questions are going to be. So, you know, 
Well, hey, we are so excited to have all three of you guys along for the ride, and we just want to give a quick plug for our Patreon page. If you're interested in supporting the Film & Whiskey podcast, you can do so on a monthly basis, and we like to give you something back in return for that. So we have $3, $5, and $7 tiers, and at each tier, you know, like uh, with a $3 tier, you get early access to episodes and you get access to our Discord channel. Uh, There's an exclusive patron chat that we're in every day talking to people. At the $5 and $7 levels, you also get uh, some bonus perks, including not just early advanced episodes, but unedited, not safe for work versions of episodes. If you like it when Brad and I argue with each other, just imagine that as a Scorsese movie and you have an idea. Completely unfiltered. Yes, 100%. So, Brad, uh, where can they find us if they want to subscribe to our Patreon? Uh, You can just check us out at patreon.com slash film whiskey. All right, guys, we're hoping to start doing this on like a semi-regular basis. And this is our first Patreon round table. What we're going to do is just have them ask us questions that they have prepared for us. And, and we're just going to see where it goes from there. I'm really excited. Uh, who wants to jump in first with our first discussion question? So I was just curious for both uh, Bob and Brad, what has been the most unexpected thing to happen as a result of doing this podcast? Uh, it can be literally anything. Just when you started this, what has occurred in the uh, year since that you just did not see happening? Oh, Brad, I, I might need some time to process that one. Do you want to jump in? Uh, I mean, between people sending us whiskey or us going to distilleries and like interviewing their CEOs and master distillers and and them offering free product, I've just been blown away by the support within the whiskey community for our podcast. It, it's I'm just shocked by it. Yeah, I think that's a really good like along those same lines. I was going to say initially, like, you know, the people that we've talked to has been really unexpected and the access that we've gotten. And I think like to some extent that's true. I mean, I think there is an extent where it's like, OK, I think we've worked hard enough and we've built up enough of an audience that like we can get a foot in the door with some of these people now. But I think the thing that continually blows me away is just kind of finding out that if you ask, people are really likely to say yes. Yep. And that was something we never anticipated. Like, you know, it took us probably two, two and a half seasons to get to the point where we could reach out to like Wild Turkey or, you know, Woodford Reserve and say like, hey, can we interview your master distiller? But as soon as we did and as soon as they checked out, you know, our media kit and our social media, they were completely on board for it. And it that is the thing that blew my mind was – Wow, I I spent the first season psyching myself out thinking like we need to start local, we need to not ask you know the big major brands for an interview and it turns out like if you ask they're going to want to do it. And I think that's that's kind of the thing that's that's blown me away was the two guys recording in their houses in Ohio are are talking to these master distillers and CEOs at multi-billion dollar corporations. And they're just completely cool to come on and talk to us about, you know, their favorite John Wayne movie or something. Yeah, I I mean, that has to be it. I I think the only other thing, Corey, would be we had Patrick Willems on the show. And that still just blows me away that he came on our show because he's so cool. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's really cool. Like when you when you kind of fall down the rabbit hole of YouTube, you know, film YouTube and he's our favorite video essayist and he you know we sent him an email he was like yeah sounds great and we sent him whiskey and then after we sent him whiskey he was like this was my favorite podcast appearance ever because they gave me whiskey and i was like all right now we know what our format is going forward offer people whiskey (laughs) and they will appreciate the time no matter what so to change gears a little bit i have a question uh more movie related y'all have both answered this at different times on the podcast before but i want to i want to hear from both of you what shaped your the way that you rate movies and that you watch movies like what is you what is your history that brought you to this point to uh decide what movie gets a 10 out of 10 and what movie gets a 3 out of 10 bob's probably gonna have a lot longer answer so i'm gonna give him a minute to think that through honestly for me i think it's a mixture of when i watch the movie it's a it's a mixture of feel like am I just purely enjoying this film like is it am I just having a good time with it and that doesn't necessarily mean like laughing it like am I drawn in by the story 
I think the second thing that I really look for is authenticity. Like how real to the human condition does this movie feel? Um, whether it is comedy or drama or romance, whatever. And then the final part of it is is more of a technical, like just was the movie well made? Um, but honestly, on any given night, the the first part, just how does it feel to me, probably has a lot more weight <laughs> than I might want to give credit. Yeah, honestly, I think for me, it's it's just gut feeling at the end of the day. Like I could I could say that I have some system. I actually saw somebody post like their system for rating movies. It was in a like a Facebook comment and an eight and a half for this guy was like a perfect expression of whatever genre the movie was in. So like a perfect, you know, perfectly fine, really funny, couldn't get any funnier comedy for him as like an eight and a half. And then if you want to get like a nine, nine and a half, ten, like there has to be something like transcendent about it. And I, I kind of agree with that. Like, I think that we've had a few movies that I've I've even admitted to Brad. Like, I don't know what I would change about this. And it's as good as it can be. And it's still only like a nine out of ten for me. And I think that what I've really found is that some movies I went into that I would have rated a ten out of ten beforehand. And you know, whatever it was, like, you know, if it was me being in a grumpy mood or having indigestion or whatever it is, I come out of that movie going like, oh, that didn't hold up nearly as well as I thought. And then there's other movies that, you know, in in any mood, in any circumstance, no matter what my day was like, when I throw the movie on, it holds up. And I think that's kind of my criteria now is like, could you put this on on your worst day? And it would still read just as well as it did on your best day. And I think that's kind of what I'm going with for a 10 out of 10 now. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm with Brad. It's kind of a gut feel thing. um, And I can't always put it into words, but you just you know it when you see it. But speaking of uh, changing gears, how about we get over to our resident trucker, Chris? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess we'll we'll shift again. Um, Back to (laughs) what's what would you say is the most surprising thing that you the two of you have learned about each other throughout making this podcast whether it's a (laughs) taste in whiskey or a taste in movie or a taste in movie snacks you know or how you watch the movie like what's the most like wow he does that kind of thing Uh, you've learned first off speaking of movie snacks i want it to be known to film and whiskey nation that my top two candies were Reese's Pieces and then peanut M&Ms. All right, I need to interrupt and, you there. And I need to just once and for all say, because it's not just you, it's my wife. Oh, no, it's, be it's quiet. Reese's Pieces, all right? It is, they Reese's literally, Pieces, yeah. the people Reese's at the, Reese's Pieces. The people oh, at the Reese's company were like, how can we better help people pronounce our name? We know, we'll add the word Pieces. Because no one can mispronounce that. (laughs) And then millions of Americans in unison stood up in their stubbornness and said, screw you. This word is now pronounced Pieces so that we can rhyme it with Reese's. I just I can't believe that we are even having this debate. It just fits, bro. Just just run with it. I believe with I align with Brad so much and it's kind of insane. I never want to hear anybody give me any trouble about saying a boot ever again. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Well, to actually get to your question, uh, Chris, I, I think I've honestly been surprised by how loyal Bob has been to bourbon as like his expression of whiskey. Like I kind of came into it in the same place as him as as definitely like really loving the sweeter whiskeys. And I, I just I, and this isn't like saying that Bob doesn't have a great palate because I think he's appreciated and really genuinely loved a lot of different types of whiskeys. Like Quinta Rubin was one of his favorites and that is not a bourbon. Um, but he he's just consistent, man. He loves his sweet whiskeys across the spectrum. And I got to respect that. He He sticks to his goat on that. OK. So with Brad, man, this is such a good question. What has been like the most surprising thing? Um, is that how you phrase it? The most surprising thing? Yeah, most su- surprising or shocking thing that you've learned about Brad uh, throughout creating this podcast. Honestly, and this is like, I don't know how to phrase this, Brad. I think <laughs> oh, I that- think it's still I think it's still the unpredictability of what Brad is going to really appreciate. 
And like I always go back to the example from season one of the Tree of Life. And how, like, I remember we were recording in a friend's recording studio and we did a marathon recording session that day. We recorded four episodes in a day and uh, we went outside to just like catch our breath in between uh, episodes. And I said, hey, man, like, what did you think of Tree of Life? Like, that's what we're going to do next. And I remember him saying, like, you know, I I still don't know where I'm coming down on it. And then over the course of talking about it, that episode, like he came around to, I think, giving it like an eight and a half out of ten. No, I think it was a nine and a half, dude. Okay, well, whatever it was. And like, I think that I've had moments like that since then where I've gone into a movie like Brad's going to freaking love this movie. And he comes out like that was the worst movie I've ever seen and <laughs> and vice versa. Like there are times where I get, you know, we get on the horn with each other and I'm like, all right, listen, man, like, I'm sorry I made you sit through that. Please don't be mean. And he's just like, what are you talking about? I love that movie. Um, And so like, I, I think it really speaks to the fact that Brad doesn't let like his tendencies of what he would normally like in a movie cloud his perception of how good something is. Like he he really does go into every movie wanting it to be good with a pretty open mind and a pretty clean slate. And I think that says a lot for him. Like even if he doesn't always come out in the same place as me, I know that it's like he doesn't just dislike a movie because it's not, you know, a Michael Bay film or something like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and and you guys don't even know my commitment to keeping an keeping an open mind is constantly put to the test by my wife. <laughs> she'll she'll sit next to me and watch like parts of these movies and literally just go. I, I've kind of thrown her under the bus here. She'll literally just go. Bob is the worst. Why is he making you watch this movie? <laughs> <laughs> and then Brad shows up and gives it a nine and a half. And then I, yeah, and then I show up. And I'm like, well, I actually you know really liked it. I will say. Uh, Bob, this might be a revelation to you. Haley and I sat down to watch the very first movie for this podcast, and we both hated it so much. And for the longest time, I was worried that I didn't like Goodfellas because, you know, my wife also just hated it. And she sat down and watched the whole film with me. And I'm so glad that we did that rewatch <laughs> to confirm to me that, no, I actually really don't like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to move on now because this is just hurting my heart. But uh, <laughs> all right, maybe we should go this route because Brad and I are going to have to break and try our whiskey here in a little bit. Why don't you guys hit us with a rapid fire kind of question? Like if you have a question in your list of something that we can answer pretty quickly, uh, let's hit those ones now and then we'll break for our whiskey. Worst whiskey you've ever had. Go. St. Liberty. Yeah, that was really bad. Uh, there was one that we tried, uh, uh, Crab Cakes and Bourbon sent, sent us a sample of one, <laughs> one from Ohio that was really, really bad. And uh, it, it was between those two. The St. Liberty, I have actually heard that some of their other expressions are very good. But when they contacted us, they said like, hey, which one do you want? And I said, you you know, which one are you trying to push? Which one do you want us to to talk about? Send that one. And so we drank the bottle they sent us and it was, it was really bad. It was really bad. <laughs> The story behind the Ohio whiskey was great, though, because you had gotten it as a sample, didn't try it, sent it to him to try, and it was so bad that Crab Cakes and Bourbon sent (laughs) sent it back to us us. in a blind flight (laughs) tasting. (laughs) That's such a power move. (laughs) It, it, It really was. No, the power move was the fact that he sent it back in the middle of like two and three hundred dollar whiskeys. That was the power move. Hey, so I had a quick one I'll jump in with here. Uh, So I'm located in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, and I was just curious if there's any whiskeys that are centralized or only available in the Carolinas or the Southeast that you would recommend. Uh, In the Carolinas. I'm actually going to ask Austin to back me up on this, but uh, there's a bourbon that I'm aware of, I think is North Carolina based, which is called Virgin Bourbon, and I'm pretty sure it's made by Heaven Hill, and they only sell it in the Carolinas. And I've seen tons of people. It may and it might be like the Carolinas and like down into Georgia. I'm not sure. But I've seen tons of people have it like on their Instagram posts. I've always wanted to try it. I've heard it's really good. I don't know. Austin, uh, are you familiar with that brand? I've heard of it. I didn't know anything about it, but I hear good things. So usually if you hear good things from the Instagram community, it's a pretty decent pour. Question. Do you have to be a virgin to drink it? No, they actually prefer that you're not, so that the only thing that's virgin 
is what's in the glass. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you should be their marketing director. <laughs> Virgin bourbon. Get your freak on. <laughs> oh, man. Austin, you got anything else for us? Yeah. What's your desert island whiskey? Wow. Um, Ooh, Weller Antique? No. I was, you know what? I've actually started liking that less and less the more I drink it, Brad. Like, Really? I would say either that uh, Teresa's batch of bookers that we had that and we loved it and no one else liked it so that I could have all of it to myself or <laughs> um, what, what was the one we ended with at the end of last season? It was B-Tech. Was it Handy? Was it Thomas H. Handy? I Yes, it was a Handy. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would take that one, I think. that I mean, like, it, that was mind-blowingly good. See, I, I agree with you, but the stuff like that is just so complex that there's a part of me that just wants something that's like smooth and drinkable. So I, I but yeah, I, I probably wouldn't disagree with you there. All right. Thank you guys for the quick rapid fire questions. And Brad, why don't we hit pause here? We have a whiskey to drink today, which is Wheel Horse Bourbon. So let's go give that a quick review before we jump back in with our patrons here. Let's get to it. All right, so today we are checking out Wheel Horse Bourbon. Brad, this is kind of a new player in the game of, I, would, I don't want to call it budget bourbon, but, you know, that like second tier from the bottom shelf kind of bourbon. Like this is, it's hitting you between $25 and $30 a bottle, which I think is a really great price uh, for what we get here. And what we get here is a sour match. Uh, a sour mash, small batch whiskey. Right on their website, it tells you the mash bill, which is 70% corn, 21% rye, and 9% malted barley. So this is a high rye mash bill. I love that they are really open and transparent about what the mash bill is. It says they use a number four char on their barrels. This bad boy comes in at 101 proof. Uh, but Brad, not to jump too far ahead into our tasting notes, I think this drinks like really sweet and actually a lot more pleasant, a lot more light than I expected at 101 proof. Uh, I've been kind of sipping on my bottle for a couple months since it came to us in the mail. I don't know if you've opened yours yet, Brad. Do you have any initial impressions on this? Yeah, Bob, as I get into the nose on this, I, I am really impressed. There's a little bit of that alcohol forwardness that you'd expect from something that's a little above bottled and bond. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting a few citrusy notes throughout that feel like kind of zesty and fun and refreshing and mixing in with all that is a little bit of the traditional sweetness. You get some vanilla and caramel. So I, I kind of like the, uh, the opening bit so far. Yeah, I do too. I, and I do think that like, if there is kind of a weak point, it is the nose because there's just this tiny hint of that. And I've used this, this really weird nosing note before, but that kind of like, Tarnex cleaner note that we get sometimes on like really young, small batch craft whiskeys. And we got especially on that uh, St. Liberty. This is nothing like that. But there's just like a little wisp where it's like you can't tell if it's quite caramely or if there's like a a really interesting cleaning product going on there. <laughs> and I say that to say this. Uh, none of that is present on the taste. I actually think, Brad, this is a phenomenal sipper. Like, it's really light-bodied, which you wouldn't expect for a high rye. And it actually, for me at least, it kind of played tricks on my palate. I would have probably guessed that this was a weeded bourbon because it has that kind of nice light brightness to it. It has that little bit of like a cherry cola note that we sometimes get on our weeded bourbons. I would not have guessed this was high rye. It definitely doesn't have any level of harshness for me. I probably wouldn't have even guessed this was 100 in one proof unless I had read it on the bottle. Yeah, it's not going to blow you out of the water with its heat on the nose, but I'm kind of excited to get into the flavor here. Are yeah. we scoring? Yeah, I think we should score, Brad. And and I would say that on the nose, I'd probably only give this about a six out of 10. On the flavor, I would definitely give this like a seven and a half. This is really, really good and I enjoy it. Yeah, I think, I think I'm kind of in the same line with you there, Bob. It's a six on the nose for me. And honestly, I haven't taken a sip yet. So uh, just give me a second here, Robert. Yeah, that's a really pleasant uh, drinking experience. It's a little bit kind of creamy. It's a lot creamier than I expected it to be. Mm -hmm. But you definitely get a bit of that bright fruitiness. And there is a long ass finish on this bad boy. I mean, the burn just sits there for a while. It sits in your chest. It doesn't overpower you, but it's a really nice, strong Kentucky bear hug that uh, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying right now. I think for flavor, though, I think I'd probably give it like a seven out of ten. It's not, it's not blasting me away, 
but it's pretty solid. Yeah, I totally agree. And and with the finish, you're right, Brad. Like, there's a little bit of that alcohol chest burn for me. It wasn't nearly as harsh as some other ones we've been drinking lately. And again, I don't know if I would have pegged this as over 100 proof unless I had read it on the bottle. I think it's really pleasant all the way around. Again, like, for the price you're paying for this, I don't think anything is really designed to wow you or knock your socks off. But it's just really, really solid all the way around. I'm going to give it a 7 on the finish. Uh, what would you say you'd give it on the finish, Brad? I think I'll stick in the same area. It's about a six and a half. I do think that the finish struggles a little bit from how powerful the hug is. I I think you miss out on some flavors that I would hope for, but it's still all around a decent finish. Well, and I think where this whiskey really shines is in the balance. Like the nose was probably the weakest point of the whole experience for me. And even that was well above average, I would think. And again, you know, we are keeping the price tag in mind here. If if we were drinking this and it was like a BTAC, I think we'd be a little more harsh on it. But just knowing the fact that this isn't going to be basically under $30 for you in most places, I, I think this is really well balanced. And I think it's right in line with some of the other really great whiskeys that we've reviewed at this price point. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 on balance. Uh, see, that that's where I think I'd struggle a little bit. There, there's not enough n- going on in the nose to really indicate where you're going with this whiskey. And then the flavor and the finish kind of goes in vastly different directions. You lose a lot of flavor at the end. So I'm actually just going to give this a five and a half out of 10 on finish. Wow, five and a half. Okay, I think we're going to come out in pretty different places on this, Brad. Uh, and, and this is where we get into the price tag, our value category. On their website, they have this listed as $31.99. It is not sold in the state of Ohio, but I actually had seen this listed in places last year for as low as $25. And I think if you're, you know, if we're splitting the difference then between $25 and $31, we're talking like a $28 bottle of whiskey. I think this is a really good value for $28, especially at the proof point. You're not going to get many 100, 101 proof whiskeys, especially from a smaller craft distiller at a price this low. It's made in Owensboro, Kentucky. And, you know, I, I just love that we're getting stuff from Western Kentucky now in places that we normally wouldn't. Brad, I think I'm going to give this like a seven and a half on value. I think it's a really great value. Uh, I'm kind of close to you there. I, I think it's like a six and a half on value, you know, twenty eight, twenty nine dollars. I feel like for me, once you hit $30, that's when I really start counting my pennies, um, you know, which might not be fair. Uh, So this is just close enough to that that I'm not going to call it a spectacular value, but it's solid. You know, like most other things in this whiskey, it's pretty good all around and I'm not going to penalize it for being what it is, but uh, it's going to end up having an average score, I think. So what are you coming out to, Brad, out of 50? I have a 31.5 out of 50. And I'm a little bit above you. I'm at a 36 out of 50, which is bringing us out to a 67 and a half out of 100 or an average of a 33.75. Now, this is just below that threshold of 35 where we normally start recommending bottles. I think I am still going to recommend purchasing this. I think you're supporting a really good business. You're helping them grow. And it's not just like... You know, sometimes, Brad, I think we would recommend craft distillers just as kind of like a sympathy, like throw them a bone, buy a bottle of their stuff so they can get better at this. I actually think like, you know, even for your score being a little bit lower than mine, they're like right there. Do you know what I mean? Like a couple more years of producing this product. And I think it's going to be a really, really reliably good product. And I think the bottle that we have is worth purchasing. Oh, 100%. I I would definitely recommend that you buy the bottle. You know, if you're living down in Kentucky and you can get it at a local bar, go for it. It, It's a really solid whiskey that for the price you're paying, yeah, definitely recommend. All right, man. Let's jump back into the fire here (laughs) and continue getting grilled (laughs) by our patrons. Should we, though? (laughs) Well, we're going to. All right, man. Let's get back to it. All right, everybody, that was Wheelhouse Whiskey's Bourbon Expression, a whiskey that we both were pretty solid with. It's a good all-around whiskey. Uh, But something that we are more than solid with, people that we just really, really love, is our Patreons. And we're excited to get back in with them. But guys, I am very curious, what are you guys drinking tonight as you join the Film & Whiskey podcast? Good old truck stop Jack Daniels. Hey, you know what, man? (laughs) When we reviewed Jack Daniels, I legitimately was like, man, this is going to be kind of a down week. Like Jack Daniels is just like a frat boy whiskey that like gets downed, you know, at at challenges in college. I was blown away, man. That stuff was daggone good for the price that you're paying. 
hey, sometimes things are the industry standard for a reason. Doesn't mean they're good. Doesn't mean they're bad. No, it's, uh, it they hold their own, even if they get uh, put down quite a bit. And I appreciate the hundred milliliter bottles so that the DOT doesn't come after me. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Austin, what are you drinking tonight? I'm drinking a Woodford Reserve Double Oak uh, store pick uh, by our, my local bourbon society here in Baton Rouge. Nice. Uh, I'm just going to say two words that are actually three words. Double freaking oaked. Like, you just can't go wrong with it. Corey, I I am nervous about what you're drinking tonight, but why don't you hit us up? What, do, what are you sipping on this evening? Yeah, well... Currently, I'm sipping on tea like the old man that I am. But earlier, I had a fantastic homemade gin and tonic uh, by my lovely wife, Megan, who I know I'm biased, but she does make the best cocktails I've had on planet Earth. And your uh, How to Cocktail series, in fact, has been very valuable to our own cocktail making experience. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. And I actually think that yesterday was National Gin and Tonic Day. So you guys are like right in line with what you should be drinking right now. Yeah, man. That's all Megan. She uh, she stays on top of that stuff. And she we when we both we both work from home. So when we've had a long day. She'll just uh, go over and whip up some incredible cocktails and and serve them up. And uh, yeah, I I need to uh, I need to go back and re-listen to some of those episodes also, so I can I can step up my game and, and make her a cocktail at the end of a long day also. Well, as we all kind of uh, imbibe and indulge here, uh, let's throw over to Corey. Uh, what's your next question on the list for us tonight? Yeah, so I had a scenario I came up with. So stay with me here for a moment. Let's pretend that there are aliens on another planet who have never watched a single movie or tasted a single whiskey. But they've listened to every single episode of the Film and Whiskey podcast. I don't know how it's possible uh, doing one without the other, but that's just what we're going to roll with. And as fans of the show, they visit you both here on Earth, and they request your recommendations specifically for the first three movies they should watch and the first three whiskeys they should drink. What are you recommending? Oh, man. Oh, Brad, this is good. All right, here's the question, Brad. Do we try to build this list together? Oh. Or are we just like building our own lists? Oh, 100%. We have to do it together. We're the Film and Whiskey Podcast, Robert. <laughs> that's, that's right. All right, so my initial thought, like three movies they should watch if they've never watched a movie, is like the first thing you need is is something that just expresses like the sheer joy of watching movies. and And like- I think for some people, that's something like The Wizard of Oz, which is a movie that Brad and I are not big on. But I'm not saying I'm let me make my point. (laughs) I would say I would say something like a singing in the rain would need to be in there. And it's not like it's not even my favorite musical, but like that is just like that. The most happy place movie I can think of off the top of my head. I think. Hmm. I I think as I jump into this question, I think the most important things about movies is that they express humanity at its best, at its worst, and everywhere in between. And so from that point of view, I feel like something like It's a Wonderful Life would have to be on there. Hmm. You know what I mean? Just to show like the ups and downs of life and humanity and and kind of what goes along with that. I I feel like It's a Wonderful Life. I'm not opposed to It's Singing in the... It's it's singing in the rain. I'm not opposed to singing in the rain either, though. I I think that's a just spectacular film that's just joyous and fun. So why don't we do this? We'll place hold both of those for our first movie. All right. I, I do think you have to have like just a classic of all classics in there, either like The Godfather or Casablanca or just something that is pretty universally regarded as this is just one of the best ever. I would, you know, I would probably throw Casablanca in there. I, I think that that would be there. There's so many different parts of that movie that are funny, dramatic, serious. Just there's a lot of different parts of that movie that are great. So, yeah, I think I, I'm I'm with you. Let's throw Casablanca in there. And then and again, you can disagree with me here, Brad. I think for me, I would probably pick something that's like the biggest spectacle. You know, like this is how big movies can be, whether so it's Star Wars. Whether it's a Lord of the Rings movie, whether it is, you know, something huge and epic like Lawrence of Arabia or Jurassic Park, like just something that that really piques the imagination and shows what you can put on screen. Star Wars. No, not Star Wars. Yes, Star Wars is on the list. No, I said that it required imagination. 
Robert, are you about to start this? <laughs> Star Wars is the single most imaginative franchise in the history of movies. Well, that's Wh- just a hundred percent. Okay, so I'm not going to get into this with you. We need to answer this question. So, all right, let's let's go back to. The, would you agree that that's a good three categories that you should have for the sure. alien visitors? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So are we going? Are we going singing in the rain or it's a wonderful life for the first one? Uh, I would lean towards it's a wonderful life. I think it's a wonderful life's a better movie. I think singing in the rain probably would appeal to the to aliens, aliens more. more? Yeah. Oh yeah, you know, with all your extensive <laughs> research into alien culture. Well, I'm even thinking like if you showed those two movies to someone that lived in like you know Bangladesh or something, like would they even recognize the small town America of It's a Wonderful Life? You know, and I understand that, like, you know, Singing in the Rain is set in Hollywood, so that's completely different, too. But I think there's just something about the singing and dancing that is so, like, elemental. Like, yeah, it's just, but like, is, it, is it elemental in that alien culture? I mean, maybe they have, like, a hive mind consciousness that has never understood singing or dancing. Maybe. Th- yeah. All right. So Brad hates music, so we're going to go with <laughs> It's a Wonderful Life. We're going to go with Casablanca. And... We'll go with Star Wars for number three so that the aliens can have something to talk to me about, about how one of their first three films was an underwhelming experience. There, there you go. <laughs> uh, that, that, that sounds like a decent list. I, I think maybe just to wrinkle your feathers, because I just listened to your State of Movies episode, I might throw in Avengers Endgame. Oh, there, gosh. Yep. Oh. Yeah, that, that would make so much sense to the aliens, Corey. You just come in seen right all at the 20 end of the other MCU movies. <laughs> We're just going to plop them into end game. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well then you just show them the whole uh, MCU and claim it's like one really, really long film. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> all this right, Brad, is how real, epic real quick. movies can be. Brad, real quick. Uh, three whiskeys. Why don't you just take this one on your own and I'll say, I'll see how much I agree with you. Um, hmm, this is hard. Cause you can't not throw a scotch in there. But even then, hmm, I'm just going to guess that these aliens are not advanced with their palates yet. So I'm going to give Quinta Rubin as the scotch um, because I think it's approachable and delicious and just one of the best evers. I think for a unique experience with bourbon, actually, you know what? The bourbon I'm going to recommend is Pursuit United. I I wow. was just blown away by that one. I I think it was it was a really fun experience that that has enough of that bourbon experience to like hit home there. And then I don't know, would I go with like a rye for my third one? I don't know. I'm trying to think of like the best ryes that we've ever had. I I'm thinking of that 6 year um the the bottle has an American flag on it. Do you oh, know yeah. what, what I'm talking about? Called? Yeah, what was that called? Man. Um y- Oh, uh, yeah, I know you're talking about. We drank it for yeah. Hamilton. Yes. Yeah, that one, I would put that in the rye category. So what I would say is I would definitely put Keats Rubin in there. I'd probably put like one of the best bourbons or ryes we've ever had. So like something that's really complex and, and you know, probably high proof. And then I would just add my third one would probably be something that's an introductory level whiskey, whether it's a bourbon or a scotch. Like if it's a bourbon, you know put a heaven hill green label in there or if it's a scotch throw monkey shoulder in there like i think you got to introduce somebody to the world of whiskey with something that gives them a really solid baseline of here's what to expect so like i don't know if i if i have one in mind let's just say monkey shoulder cuz i think that's a really great entry level scotch yeah, it really is and then you know i'd give them probably like you know the the Pfeiffer Pavit Reserve or the Thomas H Handy or something and then yep. the Quinta Rubin but uh, well, actually, nothing from BTAC because screw them. <laughs> That's true too, Corey. Thank you so much for that question, man. That was really good, man. That was like a wide ranging question. Honestly, I'm open. You know, Chris or Austin, if you guys had like one or two movies or whiskeys that you'd throw on that list, what what are you guys thinking, Corey? You could jump in there too. So I just wanted to respond with a Corey. I agree with you. We need to show them in game, maybe the whole MCU, just so they don't try anything and try to take over Earth or anything like that. Oh, that's a guy. Um, I didn't think of it from that <laughs> angle. Yeah, like here's what not to do. Exactly. Um, as far as whiskey goes, uh, one the Hamilton episode. It was resilient rye. Thank you. Yes, resilient rye. I don't have that memorized. I had to look it up, but I would I would definitely choose something that represents each category. So maybe an American category, a Scotch category and a other world category. So I'd go with something like 
a Buffalo Trace, which is kind of a mid, you know, mid tier bourbon that represents the American. I really like the monkey shoulder choice for the scotch. And I would go with, I would go with Jameson for the, the other Dang. kind of representation. Just something that's mid level, you know, lower to mid level, easily approachable for anybody, but as represents a broad category. Yeah, you can't go wrong with Jameson, man. Yeah, so I was curious about what is what is your favorite movie soundtrack, or what movie has your favorite soundtrack? So this is something that I wanted to address. Brad, because it came up in our Schindler's List episode just a couple weeks ago. And I think sometimes we have confused the words soundtrack and score when we're talking about music. So a score is usually what we refer to as like someone who wrote like an orchestral piece for a movie, like what John Williams did for Star Wars. Like that's a score. A soundtrack is usually what we refer to as like a director picking um like previous previously existing music to go along with the movie, like Scorsese with Goodfellas or Tarantino with Pulp Fiction. So I just want to make clear, like, are we talking best score or best soundtrack? Why not both? That's fine with me. Oof. Brad, go for it. I think score wise. Man, I, I really genuinely am going to stick Man, it's hard to get away from from Johnny Williams cuz he's just the best. I think Star Wars across the entire um across the their entire universe, I just think he has created some of the most spectacular music um that really gets to the heart of what's going on. I think Jurassic Park has one of the most beautiful scores ever written. Um, that moment when you come up over the ridge and you see the dinosaurs, I, it's one of the most beautiful moments in film because of the music. I think outside of that, I've been stuck on the Interstellar score lately. I I mean, I, I've been doing a lot of D&D prep, and it's just this like epically large, intricate musical masterpiece that is inspiring. And so I, I really love uh, Hans Zimmer and a lot of his work. Yeah, dude, I think that's really good. Um, I would probably say, you know, I don't know, like all the heavy hitters, all the ones we know, like anything by John Williams, anything by Bernard Herrmann. Most of the movies we talk about on the podcast have really good music in them. And so like it's I don't know, um, one that I really like from from recent years. There's a movie that came out a couple years ago called. Uh, if Beale Street could talk and it was one of my favorite movies of the whole decade and the score for that movie is like it's just freaking phenomenal it's it's jazz infused but it's like heartbreaking and it's man that one that's one that I've turned on like while reading or while studying for things the last couple years and I would probably say of the recent movies I can think of that's my favorite one I, I have to say, I can't get away from this topic without also mentioning uh, Howard Shore and Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. Holy for crap. Sure, for sure. Great question, Austin. Uh, yeah. What would you real quick? What would you say is probably the best action sequence you've ever seen in a movie? Like, say, like a, a, a gunfight or a fist fight or a car chase. Something that really gets your blood pumping every single time that you feel like you got to pause the movie and go get in a bar fight or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Um, I don't know. I feel like action action movies are such a huge, like wide spanning genre too. Like the one of the best choreographed things I've ever seen um, is in the movie Children of Men. Like there's this really great scene that happens on the interior of a car, and and the car is getting ambushed from all sides, and they have to drive away from it. And it's like this one long extended Emmanuel Lubezki shot, and that thing is fantastic. I think the opening D-Day sequence of Saving Private Ryan is like, there's a reason that people said that was the high point in the movie. You know what I mean? I don't know, man. That's a really great question. Brad, do you have anything that's coming to mind? Man, honestly, one of my first thoughts is Lord of the Rings. And it's it's either one of two. I think one of my favorite action sequences is the cave troll scene. But Helm's Deep is really hard to beat. Like, if you cut out all the extra stuff and you just had the Helm's Deep sequence, I just adore that film, that bit of filmmaking. I also have to say, like, I just watched Titanic for the podcast that's coming up in a couple weeks here. Oh, hell yeah. And the whole second half of Titanic, I think, would qualify. (laughs) It's just like, 
it is a master class in in suspense building and dread and like really heartbreaking death scenes and action moments and like I don't think people give that movie enough credit just as it, like the the scope of the disaster movie that it is and I love me a good disaster movie every now and then. Uh I'm not going to lie, I love the Mission Impossible movies and the opening sequence in uh Mission Impossible 3 is just so daggone good. Yeah, man. And I feel like action movies have just ramped up their game lately. Like Mission Impossible Fallout is Oh, dude. It's it's like a nearly perfect action movie. In in a way that like you know I hear people say it about Mad Max Fury Road, which is a great movie. I was gonna bring that but up like, myself. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's a great movie. It's like one long action sequence. But there's just something so cool about seeing Tom Cruise, the real guy, piloting a he- like a helicopter in an action sequence that is really happening in front of your eyes. Like it's just people don't do that, mm-hmm. and and the sheer value of seeing him do that and put his life at risk. Is like take my money now, every time. Yeah, uh, dude, I'm a, I'm honestly gonna stick in the Tom Cruise vein. I think one of his most underrated movies is Edge of Tomorrow, and the opening like Normandy Beach meets sci-fi is out of this world good. I think that that action sequence is just spectacular. That movie is freaking great, and not enough people have seen it. Fair enough. Uh, okay, so when Bob originally invited me to be a part of the Patreon chat. My uh, response via text was not words, but to send a meme of Nick Cage, uh, just his his big giant Nick Cage face saying, I never turned down a role, I'm in. So as uh, a member and sometimes president of the Nick Cage fan club, I just had to ask, when are we going to get some Nick Cage movies on the Film and Whiskey podcast? Because I feel like Y'all are missing out on, you know, we got Con Air, Face Off. I mean, the, the list is endless. So Wait, here's Bob, the funny have thing. We, have we You're, never done a Nick Cage movie? We haven't. And, but oh here's my the gosh. funny thing, Brad. Like, as you know, I have been doing this one movie a day thing since, like, the pandemic started. Well, actually, it was, like, later. It was in October I started it. So I'm up to, like, almost 200 movies now. And I have watched a ton of Nicolas Cage movies just I, because they're on Hulu or whatever. And like I went back and rewatched National Treasure, the first one, uh, not as good as I remembered. I went back and watched uh, Face Off and Con Air on back to back days. And it's really funny because Con Air is the most or Face Off is the most patently ridiculous plot for a movie I've ever seen. But watching Con Air after it, I was like, oh, Face Off is really well made and really well directed and like it's it's silly and dumb but like with a really good director behind it and then i was like screw it i want to watch another nicholas cage movie and i went back and watched uh raising arizona which is a coen brothers movie it was one of nick cage's first movies and brad i laughed my ass off watching that movie and i had never seen it before it was like a huge blind spot for me and i think we're probably going to work that movie into the podcast here in the next two seasons because like we want to, you know, we want to do some more Coen Brothers. This might be the best Coen Brothers movie I've ever seen, besides maybe Fargo. And like, it's just an all-out comedy. And I think like, if we're gonna do Nick Cage, why not start back at the beginning of his career and, and do that one? So we might get around to him pretty soon, dude. We could take our face off. Face ah. off. Yeah. Yeah. We really do need to do just a community community watch of Face Off. I'm I'm in, dude. Let's do it, man. All right. So I think we have time for one more question. And we just heard from Chris and we just heard from Corey. So, Austin, you get the honor of having the last question of uh, this edition of the Patreon Roundtable. OK, so I've been thinking about this one for a long time. Uh, Bob, you're going to hate me. <laughs> what is your favorite scene with your favorite actor? Oh, wow. So you got to. So the first thing you have to do is identify your favorite actor and then pick the best, your favorite scene of of that. Huh? Brad, where Hmm. would you go? That's really hard because picking a favorite actor, that alone is like incredibly daunting. I mean, besides Hugh Jackman and everything he does with The Greatest Showman, uh, I, I think there's, you know, very few options outside of that. But if I had to... <laughs> but if I had to pick... Hmm. 
I love Cary Grant. I, I don't I honestly don't think I've really talked about that on the podcast very much. That like Cary Grant is the first actor that I just like as a kid, I watched a lot of his movies with my dad that I just really love. And in order not to spoil the scene, um, because Bob has not seen this movie and I am happy to hold that over his head, the final scene from Charade is one of my favorite scenes. And I, I'm betting that most of our listeners might not have seen Charade. If you have, I'm proud of you and I love you forever. Um, but yeah, the final scene from Charade, Cary Grant is just, he's just at the top of his game. And I, I really love him and Audrey Hepburn in that film. So I'm thinking through it and like, I want to say Tom Hanks. I want to say Jimmy Stewart. And I'm going to like, I think I'm going to surprise Brad by saying this. I think my favorite performer of all time to watch is Judy Garland. And like, I think she's, I think she's an underrated actress. I think she's one of the best to ever do it. And we're going to be watching a movie in a few months here. And I actually am really hopeful Brad doesn't hate it because it's, it's very different than any other MGM musical. It's called meet me in St. Louis. And it's just the story of a family over the course of a year and like all the changes that happen to them over the course of a year. And she plays the middle daughter in this family. And there's just, I can't even pinpoint one scene. Like there's just so many little moments where she see she so shines as an actress. Uh, I guess the point, the moment that I would pick for that movie for her is uh, she sings, have yourself a merry little Christmas uh, to her like kid sister who is crying because, and this is a mild spoiler, but like, the family might have to move to a new a new place and uh, it, they find out at Christmas time. And so she's singing that song and it was the first time anybody had ever heard that song. It was written for the movie and she's singing, have yourself a merry little Christmas. And in the context that she's singing it, it's like this incredibly, it's not really sad, but it's like you understand that it, there's like layers of complexity to it. And like, you, you have to take the good with the bad. And that's why we're choosing to to be positive about this. And Watching her sing that song and the emotion on her face, it, it's just so, so powerful. And I just I don't think I can get away from how much I love Judy Garland and how she never ceases. I, I've watched so many mediocre movies with her in it, and she just like completely elevates everything she's ever been in. I think she's my favorite. And I think that's the scene I would pick. Bro, you just saved yourself so much time. Like, you can just lift this straight into that episode. <laughs> I probably will, too. <laughs> Guys, it has been such a blast to be with you here today. We want to do this probably, I don't know, Bob, like once a quarter. So, like, you know, three, four times a year. We would love to get our Patreon supporters in here in the studio with us. And we're just so grateful for all that you guys do. Once again, we'll remind you guys that uh, if you want to subscribe, if you want to support what we are doing here on the Film Whiskey Podcast, check us out, patreon.com slash film whiskey. But guys, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I know that some of you guys have your own podcasts. If you want to plug those, go for it. Chris, if you want to plug, what I don't know, what's something cool that you're enjoying right now that you just more people need to know about? Well, if you want more of the Canuck in a big truck, you can find me on Twitter at aperture underscore flash uh as for things that i need to plug i i drive a truck i don't really have much else to plug right now <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to grow my twitter right now you can find me on all the socials um when i'm not cutting out i'm a lot more interesting so guys thanks for having me this has been an absolute blast and uh thank you for all you do you keep me entertained on these long drives that truck stop internet coming on through uh, yeah, Chris, we are so thankful for all that you do here on our Discord. You're, you know, one of our bartenders, if you will, that keeps everything running smoothly. So we're just so thankful for you, man, and thankful that you take the opportunity to listen. It's it's just great to have you. You can find me on Instagram at Bourboneering. Uh, you can find my podcast wherever you get your podcast to search Bourboneering. And again, on YouTube, I'm uh, Bourboneering on YouTube. So pretty easy to find me. Yeah, and uh, just want to say thanks again to Bob and Brad for uh, having me on this Patreon chat. Uh, it was really great to get connected with and, and to meet my fellow Patreons. Uh, I'm really honored for the opportunity to support some lifelong friends and uh, a podcast that I think is really great and I really believe in. I think you two are just knocking it out of the park all the time. Uh, and I would encourage anyone 
to please, uh, I know Brad and, and Bob have already said it, but please check out the Patreon. Please support these guys. They're doing some really great stuff here. And if you want to check out the work I'm doing, uh, I actually uh, was able to have Bob on one of my very first podcast episodes. Um, but my podcast is called The Easter Pod. My name is Corey Easterday, so it's just a play on the last name. And I'm all over the place with it. My whole shtick is I just want to have interesting people on telling their stories. And I feel like I've been able to have some really great guests on covering a wide range of topics and uh, just kind of a focus on on their stories and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Well, hey, we will be back on Monday with another regularly scheduled episode. We're going to be looking at Billy Wilder's 1960 best picture winning classic, The Apartment. Uh, but until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time. 